A number of years ago, I asked my dad if his estate plan was up to date. And unfortunately, what he heard was, hey, you're asking me a question that all you're worried about is, when I kick the can, will you get my money? Unfortunately, that's not really what I was asking. I was just concerned that he had his estate plan all set. This is a common situation in many families. And what I want to share with you today is how to overcome those hurdles so you can talk about this very important conversation. But before we get there, what I want to do is make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you are alerted to when we post new videos. So I do a lot of speaking at conferences or on webinars about this very topic, which is near and dear to my heart. I call it the intergenerational conversation. How to have these conversations that have been taboo around the kitchen table. And for me, it's very near and dear to my heart because one day last year, my mother and my daughter on the same day asked me for some help financially. Yeah, it was very easy to be very quick to yes with my mom. And I wasn't quite so fast with the yes to my daughter. So it is something that I deal with that can cause stress for all of us. And I want to help you to overcome that stress and to be able to make this conversation a little bit easier with those in our family members who are older than us and also the other way to help to educate and empower our kids. So let's start with my conversation with my dad. And my goal really was really seriously, are you all set? Have you made sure that you've put in place the plans necessary to do whatever it is your goals are? And most importantly, so that you don't end up burdening us later on if things aren't in place. But what he heard and what many have heard for generations is you just want me to pass so you can get your hands on my money. That's not it. So I want to share with you a couple of easy ways to think about opening up this dialogue. And the most important thing to remember is when you do this, don't talk directly about money per se. Open the conversation up in a different way. Let me share that with you now. So a number of years ago when my dad was still around and my mom's still here and we were around the kitchen table, literally, and I asked my mom and my dad together. I said, mom, when dad passes, do you know where everything is? And the reason why I addressed that to her was my dad was the one who handled most of the finances. Not that my mother was illiterate about it. She just wasn't hands on with some of the items. So I asked them together, you know, mom, when dad passes, you know, do you know where everything is? And I just kept silent after I said that and waited because my mom then started to exhibit a little bit of an anxious moment. Well, reality setting in in her mind. He's not here. Do I really know where everything is? What's going to happen when he's not here and I have to deal with all of this? I know I can handle it, but it is going to be a burden. I don't know where everything is right now. And the important thing to remember is when one or the other is gone and we're dealing with the emotional burden of it to also have to deal with the financial stresses as well. It's not good. So we need to figure out a way to deal with that now when they're both here. So as you have this conversation, potentially with your parents, if they're still around, and you start the conversation together, maybe it's a Zoom call these days, who knows? And you say, mom, dad, and go to one or the other, and say, you know, when he or she isn't here, do you know where everything is? And again, there may be some nervousness or anxiousness, and that can open up the dialogue to say, listen, here's a couple of opportunities, a couple of strategies that you could put in place. The two of you together now can take a look at what's happening so that you can get more of a handle on it now. One is just to have an emergency contact list. It's a one pager and you can go online or you can create it yourself. You know, who's the financial advisor, who's the accountant, 
who's the attorney, where are the documents, uh, you know, what are the passwords, who do you call in, in case of an emergency, you know, put the one pager in a safe deposit box, have it virtually stored somewhere so that you have a, a list of people or items or places or things so that when one is no longer here, or even if there's just an infirmity, and it impairs their ability to take care of things, that both of them know where everything is. Now, I'll take this one step further, and it's what we do with our clients. And what we do with our clients is what we call the financial organizer system. I want to show you exactly, we, we have a book Okay, and what we do is we collect it, and this is actually mine. As you can see, it says the Singer Family Personal Financial Organizer, and it has all my tabs in them, from emergency contact lists to investments, you know, tax information, trusts, estate planning, charitable giving, bank documents, etc. It's got everything in here so that when I am no longer here, I've put it all in place. It takes some time to, to bring it all together, but I will tell you now, I was the first of my own clients going back now 12 or 14 years ago that I did this for myself, and it was the most powerful exercise I had done. Put me in control, because what, what, what's the reality of things? We get all this paperwork, we sort of put it on the shelf in the closet, and it just adds up, right? Most of it's just old insurance, you know, enhancements or new languages and stuff that we kind of sort of know where things are, but we don't know exactly what we own. So by doing the financial organizer, you actually go through all that paperwork, shred a bunch of it because it's old and it's useless, and really puts you in so much more control. A study was done a number of years ago that said for those who are retiring, one of the biggest things that stresses them out is this lack of organization or control. And by creating your own financial organizer system, you can now achieve more of that control and have more organization. And let me share with you a couple of stories that have been a real benefit to me and a friend of mine as a result of having created the financial organizer system. So the, the first story is my daughter was taking a semester abroad in Barcelona. Had a great time. We actually went over there for two weeks, not only just visited her in Barcelona, but also was in Portugal and other places in Spain. Had a grand old time, except for the first day I was there when I went to the local patisserie in Lisbon. And when I left picking up my pastries and got on the bus to then go to the hotel, realized two stops later, oh my goodness, I had been pickpocketed. Very first day there. So I decided to get to the hotel, go to a local cyber cafe and access to my virtual financial organizer system because we put it up, you know, in, in my, um, investment accounts, we have it virtually up there with all the documents, and I accessed my financial organizer through there and then was able to contact the credit card companies to make sure that, you know, they stopped the credit cards immediately, which gave me some peace of mind that even though my stuff was out there, nobody could do anything with it. So I didn't have to die in order to get a benefit from my financial organizer system, but for me, it was very powerful. Let me tell you a different story. So a friend of mine, her father passed away. And while she was up speaking about her father in front, in front of the congregation, she talked about the financial order that was put in place by her dad. And after everybody, you know, exited, a lot of people went up to her to ask her not so much about her dad but this financial organizer that helped to put in place step by step what the family now needed to do now that he was no longer here. Certainly they were experiencing emotional distress and pain, but from an organizational and financial perspective, he had put everything in place. And that really provided some sense of peace 
to the family members that were still left behind. So opening up the conversation with regards to mom, dad, you know, when one of the two of you isn't here, will you be all right? It's an opportunity to talk about organization and control and potentially something like a financial organizer system. The second way to do this is to talk about estate planning in general. And one way to do it is, and I, when I do this on my webinars, I tell people, listen, go to your mom or dad, if they're both here or just one of them, and just talk about, hey, I just saw this webinar or this video, and this guy talked about the durable power and the healthcare proxy, and how those documents were probably from a lot of estate planning attorneys that he spoke with, more important than just the basic will. Mom, dad, do you have the healthcare proxy and the durable power? And if so, when was the last time you updated it? And that will give you an opportunity to open a conversation about the finances because the healthcare proxy and the durable power and basically all of the estate planning documents should be updated every, let's call it three to five years, or if life changes in between and your objectives change. But it gives you an opportunity getting back to what, again, my goal was with my conversation with my dad, which was just to make sure everything was all set, that he buttoned it up, dotted the I's, crossed the T's, so he didn't leave a burden to the rest of us. I wasn't interested in getting his money. I just wanted to make sure everything was all set. And by asking the question, you know, I just had this conversation. I just saw this video about healthcare proxies and durable powers. When was the last time you updated yours, mom and dad? And then be quiet. It'll give an opportunity for you to have a dialogue about money per se, but it's more about what your goals are to make sure that everything is in place. So hopefully those will help you out in talking to your parents. Now, with regards to talking to your kids, I think it's important to share with them. Again, it's the intergenerational conversation. We want to make sure they're all set. We want to make sure that we pay it forward with our kids too, and we empower them. Have conversations with them about money, what your values are, what you've learned about it. Help them to understand the power of compounding. Einstein called it the eighth wonder of the world, right? If we can teach our kids, as I taught my daughter and I'm doing with my granddaughter now, show them the power of putting small amounts of money away early. Put a dollar away a week, $5 a month into the piggy bank or open up a mutual fund for your child. If, he or she is a teenager. It's just short money. You could do it for probably $200 or $250. And show them the journey of the stock market. As the money goes up, as the money goes down, and then comes back up again, it's important to share with them that journey. Get them invested, empowered early. Because the more that we can empower them, the less later on they will look to us for help and they will allow us to be free and them to be independent with regards to money. I don't want my child to, to continue to look at me as an ATM. Now that she is independent and on her own, that's beautiful for both her and for me. So address these intergenerational conversations, have these conversations with them, open the dialogue, but do it correctly and everybody will be able to be on the same page. And when it comes to preparedness for your retirement, make sure that you hit our quiz to find out which stage of retirement planning you are in. Hopefully you've enjoyed this, and I hope that you enjoy the retirement journey.